If you know anything at all about Mormonism, it's almost certainly some really crazy shit. After all, as Newton demonstrated with his third law of motion, a group cannot simultaneously be known for magic underwear and sane stuff. But I'm willing to bet that even if you know a lot of crazy shit about the Mormons, you only know the tip of the iceberg. You see, as I'm fast learning, thanks to the Naked Mormonism podcast, there are more layers of lunacy underlying that church than a sane person could possibly imagine. So to give us a little taste of the crazy, I've invited that show's host, Bryce Blankenagel, on to tell us about one of the most significant moments in that church's history, the death of its founder. Bryce, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Noah. You bet, you bet. Okay, so now before we get to Joseph Smith, tell me a little bit about your show. In a nutshell, what is Naked Mormonism? So Naked Mormonism is basically just a show taking on the history of the Mormon church. I try and rely heavily on quotes from people that were there and try and advance the storyline in a basic chronological format, starting from Joseph at a young age, advancing slowly as we progress through episodes up to the release of the Book of Mormon and the beginning of the church, and so on and so forth. Okay, so now are you aiming this show at, at Mormon believers or at maybe like the apathetic half ass Mormon, or are you just arming atheists with this knowledge? Who's the show for? What are your goals? Um, Honestly, I didn't really start the show. Stupidly, I didn't start the show with a target audience. I just kind of created it for whoever the hell wanted to listen to it and wanted to know more about naked history of the Mormon church. So I do it from a basically, uh, not to bum the term, but a scathing atheist perspective. I try and add in as many rants and cuss words that I can and uh, get into my own feelings of what happened and how I feel like the church has wronged me in the past without being without it being too heavy handed in the narrative. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of wanted to just appeal to the atheist crowd so they can have this knowledge so they can debate a couple of missionaries riding bicycles down their neighborhood. Oh, I'm street. dying to see one now. <laughs> I am dying to see one. <laughs> Me too. I haven't met a single one since I started yet. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, right. But I I mean, I kind of want anybody that wants to know about history to listen to it. Of course, your listening audience, is, it caters to them quite a lot. But also any Mormons that want to know or any Jack Mormons, as they're called, people that believe in the church but don't really follow it. If they want to know what is really there, then I want the information to be available for them. And i got to say, I, what really impresses me about the show is that you do a very deep dive. You talk about the original sources. You talk about what points uh, the apologists like to throw out, etc. And, okay, so let's, let's move on to kind of give a little taste of your show to our audience. Now, I would imagine that most of us, you know, know about at least the basics of the story of Joseph Smith and his bullshit golden plates. But if you don't mind, give us a bit of an overview of the pertinent story between the start of the church and that fateful day in 1844. So they started up in Fayette, New York, and that's where Joe started his original church on April 6, 1830. Very soon after that, moved to a place called Kirtland, Ohio. So after a fair amount of persecution from the locals there, everybody, all the Mormon congregation, which was you know almost 1,000 people at that time, packed up and moved to a town called Far West, Missouri. So upon arriving there, Joe was given revel or was given or gave or came up with revelations that would guarantee that Missouri was the place that Mormons would have their you know their free theocratic reign of the area. So now this is where the um the the whole Garden of Eden being in Missouri thing comes from. Yeah, that is correct. Yes, that's how it okay. all started out in Jackson County, Missouri. <laughs> That's amazing. Just two states over. It's just two states over, guys. The Garden of Eden, right over there. Okay, I love it. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's great. So that's that's why um, the Mormon Church owns more property in Missouri than the state of Missouri itself nowadays. Because, oh wow! Yeah, yeah, they're they're getting ready for it. Well, yeah, okay, they're going to need it after the rapture. I guess. Right, you. exactly. So the Mormons had kind of taken to telling people that were living in Missouri before them that this was the land promised to the Mormons by God. And, of course, God was giving them control of the region. Oh. Yeah, right. Well, this is barely half a century since America had been liberated from British control. And, of course, the people were still understandably scared of somebody like Joe coming along and establishing his own theocratic kingdom. Right. Right. So the Missourians kind of just drove the Mormons out. I mean, literally, torch and pitchfork, they, they chased them all out of there. So oh, they Frankensteined his ass. Yeah, okay. yeah, right. they, they didn't want anybody out around. They're, they didn't want the Mormons around because they were fucking crazy. And, well, they were doing some other stuff, yeah. too, but we won't get into the details there. So Joe and his brother Hiram Smith 
uh, were actually captured during this uh, chasing out, and they were taken to a place called Liberty Jail in Missouri, um, while the rest of the Mormons fled to a little town called Quincy, Illinois. And this, well, this happened in 1838. This was six years before the Carthage Jail incident. Okay, and, and obviously we don't have time to get into all of his exploits, but this was not Joe's first trip to a jail. He, he was quite familiar with what they looked like, I believe. N no, not his first and definitely not his last. So um, what ended up happening, Joe and Hiram s escaped from Liberty Jail, literally escaped, and they ended up rejoining with the Mormons in Quincy. Well, Quincy wasn't big enough to accommodate this, you know, this burgeoning cult and all the people that were moving in. So mm -hmm. Joe and Hiram decided to move everybody 50 miles north along the Mississippi to a town that they called Nauvoo, Illinois. And this is where Joe went completely apeshit and kind of embodied the theocrat that he'd always dreamed of becoming. Oh, okay, now, so I've been listening to your show up through the first 20 episodes, and for you to say this is when he went ape, I mean, he was pretty ape shit before this as well, so <laughs> what kind of control was he taking here? So some of the things that, the, that Joe was doing there, this town had its own bank that ended up going bankrupt, and it had its own proprietary notes. Uh, there was a library there, a bar. Joe li actually lived in the hotel there, and he ran it. There was a communistic-like supply storehouse that was referred to as the Bishop's Storehouse. There was actually a brothel there. It, they had their own newspaper. <laughs> yes. Wait, the Mormons had their own brothel? <laughs> yes, their own brothel. I mean, honestly, when you say the, Mar the Mormons had their own bar, that freaks me out from what I know of Mormons. But they had their own brothel? Their own brothel. The name of it uh, eludes historians. I'm not sure if anybody knows what the name of it was, but they had their own brothel there. Uh, when when we get Heath back on, we'll put 30 seconds on the clock for that. A, a Mormon brothel. He'll be, he'll be good at that. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> That's fantastic. So um, beyond that, they had a, their own newspaper, which was called The Times and Seasons. And then most importantly of all, they uh, Joe had his own armed forces that were called the Nauvoo Legion. He had an army. He had an army, not, not a little army. So uh, <laughs> like I said, Joe was running this shit and he was going insane. Like he was king shit of Nauvoo, right? So to get some sort of idea of the perspective here, by 1844, the year that Joe died in Carthage, the population of Nauvoo rivaled that of Chicago, which was obviously the biggest city and still is in Illinois. And that was around 20,000 people at that time. And it was just exclusively Nor Mormons in Nauvoo. So the wow. Nauvoo Legion was somewhere between five and 7,000 men strong, whereas the entire United States Armed Forces was less than 9,000. So honestly, when I say that Joe was king shit, he was the theocratic king of his own little kingdom with armed forces and all. Wow, and basically his, his own money. So you are not using theocrat in a hyperbolic sense here. No. He was literally trying to create his own government, his own... A theocratic government in Illinois. He wasn't trying. He was successful. He did it. He was he was insulated in this little town that he had created just so he could be king of it. But, I mean, right before his death, he actually held the title of a prophet and president of the church, then mayor of Nauvoo, and then he, he liked to be referred to as General Smith, not necessarily, oh, of course he <laughs> not necessarily prophet. But then he signed letters as Lieutenant General of the Nauvoo Legion. Oh, he got promoted there. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. Then he was the U.S. He was a U.S. presidential candidate, and then he was ordained as king over the House of Israel forever by his secret council of 50 in April of 1844, and he died in June. Wow, okay. So if he had gone beyond June, we would have had even better titles than, I'm sorry, what was it, king over the house of Israel? Yes, and that was just one quote. There's other quotes from other people that were in this secret little council that called him king of the nation, king of all rulers. Called He was ordained as the king of kings in the United States. I mean, does it make wow. any sense why people were uh, afraid of this guy? Yeah, no kidding. So, I mean, Joe was kind of just this polyandrous cult leader slash theocratic dictator that was literally setting himself up to take over the United States. And honestly, if he wanted to do so by military force, he probably could have made a hell of an effort at it. 
I mean, if he, if he didn't succeed outright. Whew. Well, this leads us to why he was in Carthage jail in the first place. All right, and from what I know of Joseph Smith, I'm betting this at least somehow involves him wanting to fuck somebody's wife. <laughs> you are correct. All right, awesome. Amazing. So beginning here, there are a few characters we need to introduce. These characters here are William Law and Jane Law, husband and wife. Okay. Joe wanted to fuck Jane, and Emma, Joe's wife, wanted to fuck William. So neither William nor Jane liked this idea very much. I can't figure out why. So they decided to leave the church. And they took a whole bunch of polygamy-related incriminating documents with them. So when William attempted to print these documents and expose Joe and the child-fucking polygamy ring, Joe and his buddies decided to blow up Law's printing press. This is the actual order from Joe to the city marshal of Nauvoo to destroy the press, and it marks Joe's undoing in just one little paragraph. Quote, you are here commanded to destroy the printing press from whence issues the Nauvoo Expositor and pie the type of said printing establishment in the street and burn all the expositors and libelous handbills found in said establishment. And if resistance be offered to your execution of this order by the owners or others, demolish the house. And if anyone threatens you or the mayor or the officers of the city, arrest those who threaten you. And fail not to execute this order without delay and make due return hereon. So End let it quote. be written, so let it be done. It's got all this <laughs> missing there. So yeah, that's, all, that's exactly what it is. Joe told the marshal of the city to go fuck up the press, destroy the equipment inside, and burn the remaining of the copies of the newspaper in the middle of the street in the dead of night. And apparently not knowing that mayor of Nauvoo doesn't outrank all three branches of the federal government and the Constitution combined, I guess. I don't think that mattered to Joe wow. whatsoever. <laughs> so destroying a printing press was considered an act of tyranny, of course, in direct violation of the First Amendment. Not only that, but a lot of people in Illinois were really pissed off about it. A lot of members of the church that were dissenters had cobbled together with the other breakoff factions in the area to demand resolution for this act of tyranny and oppression. Sounds fair. Yeah, well, out of fear for his own life, of course, Joe declared martial law in Nauvoo and had the Nauvoo Legion roam the streets armed and ready for a fight, should anybody make an attempt on his life. This was like trying to put a fire out with kerosene, and it really just pissed off more people and created more dissenters. And more fear, I can only imagine. Holy shit, yeah. Right. Martial law. He was the governor, and the, or sorry, he was the general and the mayor and the, the king. king. And, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and he declared martial law on these people for something that he did because he was afraid of rioting or mm. people trying to kill him or whatever. So then we have on June 12, 1844, a guy named David Bettisworth arrested Joe with a writ of indictment that was written by Thomas Morrison, who was a judge in Illinois at the time. So Joe was pretty pissed off about being arrested, so he petitioned Governor Thomas Ford with a writ of habeas corpus, asking to be let off the hook until, you know, he could be properly charged and tried. For whatever reason, this Governor Ford complied, and Joe and Hiram took off running after, after of course, the arresting officer let him go. Uh, so just Joe and Hiram. He leaves his wife, his family, all his followers and everything, and just hauls ass? He was looking out for his own ass. I mean, he wasn't going to care about what it is. No, nobody else was in trouble. It was all about what was yeah, going right, on in right. Joe's life and Joe's world. I mean, he didn't care about other people. So what ended up happening was Emma Smith, Joe's wife, wasn't a big fan of how many times Joe had eluded the legal system. So she sent Joe's childhood friend, Oren Porter Rockwell, with a letter to give to Joe, urging him to return and face the music. So Joe ended up reading Emma's letter and replied to them, quote, If my life is of no value to my friends, it is of none to myself, end quote. This letter from Emma and the words of Rockwell Calhoun and his brother Hiram Smith convinced Joe to return to Carthage and turn himself in. So Joe knew that he had fucked up in the situation, and he had to stand by his own pile of shit and own up to the smell. He also knew how much the people of Illinois hated him. 
So he was certain this would be the death of him and his fellow Mormon brothers. So let's go to the jail scene itself. All right, so it's uh, Joe and Hiram. Now, who else gets arrested with him? So we have John Taylor, and then we have huge, fat-ass Willard Richards. Um, they were all responsible just by association for blowing up the press on June 7th, 1844. They all ended up turning themselves in under Hiram's request, and this leads us to the day of June 27th, 1844, the Day of Reckoning. The jail wasn't like how we picture jails today. Basically, it was just a two-story house in the middle of Carthage, Illinois, with three different rooms for prisoners. So the four men, when they were first brought to the jail, had started in the upstairs dungeon, it was called, which was just a dark room with no windows and a deadbolt on the outside of the door. After good behavior, they had moved to the main floor jail cell, which kind of looked like the living room of a house, but the windows had bars on them and they couldn't be opened. Well... The men were fearing for their life that assailants might come to the windows and just shoot them like rats in a cage. So after a few days of good behavior in that room, the men were moved to the upstairs jail cell, which was basically just a large bedroom with a couple of beds, chairs, and a desk. The windows didn't even have bars on them, and they could be open to allow some airflow through the room, which of course was appreciated for June in Illinois. The door to the room was also in ill repair, and it wouldn't even latch shut. The only thing keeping the men in the house at this point were the downstairs jail guards and the lock on the front door to the jailhouse. But, respectively, the only thing keeping out the assailants were the jail guards and the lock on the front door, which was only latched during night hours. Oh, wow. So, during this imprisonment time, a few of Joe's little minions had been given permission to visit Joe for the purposes of tending to their food, tobacco, and wine needs, and relaying letters to the church in Nauvoo. Okay, now, I, I know this is kind of minor at this point compared to all the other crazy shit that Joseph Smith has done so far, but I find it hilarious that the founder of Mormonism is sitting in a prison smoking a pipe and getting drunk. <laughs> you know, it's it's something that isn't really talked about in the real history, um, or sorry, in the reported history of the church. They, uh, mm -hmm. for some reason, they kind of omit those details. Can't figure out why. Huh. So one of these guys that was granted permission was a guy named Cyrus Wheelock. And this is another quote from the History of the Church, Volume 7, page 100, recounted by John Taylor. Quote, Elder Cyrus H. Wheelock came in to see us, and when he was about leaving, drew a small pistol, a six-shooter, from his pocket, remarking at the same time, Would any of you like to have this? Brother Joseph immediately replied, Yes, give it to me, whereupon he took the pistol and put it in his pantaloon's pocket. After taking this pistol from Wheelock, Joe gave a derringer that he had to his brother Hiram, saying, You may have use for this. End quote. This is a hell of a jail so, they got going here. It's not like he, he didn't bake it into a cake here or anything. <laughs> and the the idea of it is just kind of ridiculous. Hey, we know that a big mob is probably going to come and kill you. Do you want a single six-shooter pistol? It right. might help. Right. And six bullets, yeah. <laughs> so the day slowly commenced with multiple confirmed death threats on Joe's life. Joe gave Willard Richards a dollar to give to the jailer in order to bring some wine, pipes, and two papers of tobacco to the cell. The jailer obliged, and just as Joe and friends took their first drinks of wine, they heard a rustling downstairs. There was a loud cry for surrender, and four shots fired indoors to intimidate the jail guards. They bailed, and the prisoners were left to the mercy of the mob that had gathered outside and at the bottom of the steps leading up to the second floor jail cell. Hiram ran for his pistol, and John Taylor and Willard Richards both grabbed their canes. I feel like there should be some ominous music that plays at this point. Okay, so there's a lynch mob <laughs> of, like, a couple hundred people downstairs. Joe has six bullets, and his militia is nowhere to be seen. Now, I hate to say this since we're just getting to the Tarantino-y bits, but we're way out of time here. And this sounds like a perfect spot for it to be continued. So, so what say you stick around, and then through the temporal magic of podcasting, we do the second half of this story next week. Well, that sounds good to me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on this week. I appreciate it. Awesome, awesome. Well, thanks for wetting our appetites. I'm going to give it a quick hard sell here. <clears throat> Will Joseph Smith and his pals shoot their way out? Will God intervene and save his beloved prophet? Will the My Little Ponies arrive in time to rescue them? No, but find out what does happen next week in the exciting conclusion of the Bryce Blankenagle interview.